Thank you, Alan. Uh, hi, uh, Carla. It's, uh, it's good to see so many people again in, uh, in person. Um, and uh, I, it was amazing to hear some of these uh, inspirational talks today. And kind of reminds me of the time when we were talking about uh, surgical simulation and, and promise of surgical simulation 20 years ago. Uh, and um, unfortunately, despite hundreds or thousands of publications uh, uh, and, and really high quality research in that field, I think today uh, we still feel that uh, the, 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 uh, this amazing promise of surgical simulation didn't get fulfilled. We still, uh, uh, we, we still uh, do uh, uh, selection, promotion, certification, and assessment uh, uh, in an uh, in a old-fashioned way with a bunch of people around the table using, uh, using subjective methods. So I hope in uh, uh, 10, 20 years uh, we will see a lot of these ideas, a lot of the visions that we are discussing today about uh, surgical data science, AI, and modern technologies become a reality. So today I will uh, not uh, focus that much on uh, providing a literature review of what's been published. Uh, I'm not going to talk so much about the vision. I just wanted to share a few uh, examples of things that uh, we do uh, today and we feel that <clears throat> it can provide value to uh, our profession today. So I have a disclosure, uh, as uh, Dr. Federico uh, and, uh, and, and mentioned before, uh, I am the founder of, a, of an academic startup uh, in, in, uh, in Toronto, so uh, this is my uh, uh, conflict. Uh, <clears throat> and I usually like uh, showing this uh, image of our research institute. Uh, which is just across our street, uh, across the street of our, uh, uh, from our hospital in downtown uh, Toronto, and I always uh, look at the, the bridge there. And I think it's symbolic, it's important bridge, and especially today when we talk about vision, when we talk about research, I think it's important to look for this bridge between research, between uh, academic and commercial activities, and the clinical space. The bridge that connects our work with the patient, because none of it matters. Uh, if we don't make an impact in the way we practice and the way we uh, take care of, uh, of our patients. Uh, I think one of the previous speakers talked about uh, the need of uh, um, <clears throat> defining questions uh, with, with everything we do. And uh, again, we identify, we, we always do things the same way. We identify problems, we, we, uh, uh, we define questions, and then we seek for opportunities to solve these uh, questions. And I, and I think uh, AI, uh, in general, can uh, provide a lot of benefits to us today to uh, deploy automation uh, and, object and extract uh, objective, high-quality structured data from uh, large amounts of unstructured uh, data streams. Uh, it's very important to bring the, the, the topic of explainability. Uh, we, we, we don't want to create uh, new black boxes here. We want to illuminate the black box uh, of, of, of surgery uh, in an explainable way. Uh, so that uh, whenever we use it as clinicians, whenever we interact with uh, these modern technologies in our daily practice, we understand why certain decisions were recommended and why certain actions are recommended. And also it's very important to address the question of scalability. I think uh, AI can do a lot there uh, to uh, bring the subjective measurement uh, from uh, theory to practice and uh, not only for select uh, highly funded uh, uh, academic centers around the world but to every uh, learner uh, in, uh, in our profession. So uh, <clears throat> I always uh, like thinking about how we do things in this circle of improvement in DOR. Uh, we always need to start with measuring our performance. We need to know what we do right and wrong. Without knowing that, we have no, no, uh, no way of improving it. Uh, we need to quantify various uh, safety parameters. We need to understand uh, what are the safety threats, what are the resilience supports uh, in our uh, operating rooms. We need to understand where we lose efficiency, how can we do a better job uh, in doing more cases uh, in, uh, in our daily practice. We need to understand compliance to standard operating procedures. And again, as I said before, we need to understand to be able to quantify the good and the bad, and then design targeted individualized uh, uh, solutions, educational solutions. Uh, I think uh, the time of one size fits all uh, when we talk about surgical education and uh, surgical quality improvement is gone. 
uh, in order to be effective uh, with uh, the solutions we create, they need to be targeted, they need to be individualized. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that the patterns of performance in an operating room downtown Toronto are very different uh, than the, the, uh, uh, the observations or the um, uh, uh, patterns in a, in a uh, uh, OR downtown Boston or Stanford, Amsterdam uh, or anywhere on, in, uh, else in the world. So we need to understand our practice. We need to design targeted individualized interventions to address uh, education and quality improvement. And we can do that with existing uh, strategies that have been uh, developed and implemented with great success in other high-risk, high-performance industries. And again, once we've done that, we can measure how that impacted our performance and, and again, it starts, uh, the, 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 the circle continues. So, uh, um, it, uh, the, the, the big challenge for us, uh, and we started working on that uh, probably 20 years ago uh, when, I was, uh, when I was working uh, on uh, <clears throat> various educational projects, uh, at that point, primarily in a simulation environment, uh, we saw massive variability in, in performance and other factors uh, in a simulated environment. We wanted to see whether that was the case uh, in the operating room. Uh, is we've always had challenge with accessing data. Uh, so uh, that's why we, we, uh, we designed, with help of engineers at the University of Toronto and human factors experts and designers, uh, in our institution, we, we developed this platform that allows us to acquire video, uh, audio, and a bunch of other uh, metrics, and then process these uh, metrics to develop to uh, uh, output that matters to us, the output that helps us quantify our performance, both on a technical and non-technical level, that helps us to quantify risks, uh, that helps us to understand also what uh, we uh, do well, the, well, what are the resilience supports that we need to identify, celebrate, and uh, reinforce. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, it uh, kind of froze here. All right, uh, so uh, in, in the next few minutes, I want to share a few examples of how we use AI in uh, our daily uh, work today. And again, this is not a vision, this is something uh, that we use today. And one of the, the fundamental uh, principles when we talk about uh, data acquisition, especially highly sensitive uh, audiovisual data in the operating room, is the, questions of, uh, the, the, the question of privacy, confidentiality, uh, risk. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> some of the previous speakers uh, uh, discussed that. Uh, so in order for this to be successful, in, in order for this process to be uh, introduced at scale in surgical practice, we felt that the fundamental principle uh, was to ensure that everybody, both uh, uh, healthcare providers, but also patients, privacy and confidentiality is respected and the whole process uh, was confidential and non-punitive. So that's why we uh, developed, this was the first AI algorithm that we uh, uh, developed and, uh, uh, and introduced in, uh, in, in production. Uh, we call it the identified by design. So the algorithm identifies uh, uh, individuals with very high uh, accuracy. Uh, and it blurs uh, their faces and cartoonifies the bodies and pitches their voices in an in irreversible way. Um, so um, the, the second uh, uh, big uh, theme that was important for us was to quantify performance. I mentioned a little bit before uh, some of the disappointment in simulation was the way we measure and, 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 and educational activities uh, has been the way we measure uh, surgical performance at scale. Uh, and again, here that matters not only that that, uh, that uh, involves not only technical performance, but uh, but not also non-technical performance. And uh, a lot uh, a lot of this got a lot of uh, attention after the initial paper uh, from Berkmeyer and the group in Michigan, uh, which showed that performance in the operating room matters. Since then. <clears throat> We've uh, evaluated, uh, we've introduced various ways to measure surgical performance now using AI algorithms uh, in, in different surgical procedures. This is an example in laparoscopic gastrectomy for cancer. We've done it, we've done it also in gynecological surgery in various urological procedures. And the conclusion is always the same. Performance matters. Technical performance is an independent predictor for postoperative outcomes. So, so we need to measure it. We need to study it, we need to understand it, we need to understand what are the factors that impact uh, our performance, and we have to continuously improve it because that matters. Uh, 
So this is an example of an algorithm that we've been working on for uh, several years now, and we just uh, launched it a few uh, uh, months ago that allows us <coughs> to measure uh, technical performance. Uh, we call it, uh, and, and that was in, in laparoscopic, but also in, uh, in open surgery. So this is an example of one of our uh, PhD students who developed, who assembled this uh, video AI-driven uh, video camera uh, that's attached, that's wearable, uh, and it can uh, uh, capture very high quality view of the surgical field in open surgery and quantify our motion, identify in instruments, uh, and so on. Uh, the, the algorithm that, uh, that generates uh, uh, output uh, and quantifies surgical performance, we called it uh, OR Vision. It's, uh, uh, we've published a number of papers, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, others are coming. And one of my colleagues working on this, uh, uh, Frank Rujic, who is a computer scientist, one of, uh, one of the major, I, I can still hear his voice about the explainability. He, for him, uh, it was of highest, uh, uh, priority to be not only able to quantify surgical performance, but also do it in a way that's explainable, that uh, uh, that uh, 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 surgeons can understand, and also uh, the, the the feedback that it provides the, the, uh, to the uh, surgical practitioners uh, is uh, would allow them to improve their uh, uh, performance and and provide them some feedback. So it's it's almost like uh, an, an automated coaching intervention. So it quantifies performance across uh, several uh, domains, but basically they're grouped around motion tracking. Uh, Filippo talked a little bit about uh, kinematic data, uh, coordination, uh, bimanual coordination, and fine. Uh, 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 Motion. So at the end of each procedure, each learner, each resident, each fellow, and also us, uh, those of us who've been practicing for many years, can see what we did right and what we did wrong. And if it's something that we, in a case where we underperformed, we can understand why the computer vision gave us this score. Uh, so this, I think, will make a tremendous impact. Uh, and again, there are many, uh, many groups working on similar uh, initiatives. I think once these initiatives reach the, the, uh, the, the, the clinical reality, I think we'll see a tremendous impact on competency-based education. We've been talking about competency-based education for decades, uh, and uh, we haven't seen uh, that many meaningful initiatives there other than the, 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 the usual subjective evaluation and, uh, and uh, uh, in training reports. Uh, so I think that this will allow our, our learners to get access to their data to understand how they progress, whether they meet milestones or not, uh, and uh, add some more transparency and explainability in the way we evaluate them. Something else that matters a lot to our group is uh, the way we measure teamwork, the way we measure non-technical aspects of our performance. And again, since we have access to uh, external video data, we can quantify um, individuals, uh, we know how many people are in the room, we know where they are, we know how they interact, and we can also monitor their communication so that we can quantify these aspects of our of the non-technical performance uh, in the operating room. So this is again something that matters, there is a lot of data that uh, uh, we uh, have published and will be publishing in the coming months that shows that non-technical performance matters. Non-technical performance impacts our technical performance, so who is with us, and we've always known that. When we enter the operating room in the morning, we know whether that's gonna be a good day or a bad day. Uh, and uh, now we can support that with, uh, with high quality objective data. A third example of uh, what uh, we've been working on for the past few years was <clears throat> an algorithm to uh, detect, to recognize what we call intraoperative adverse events. Uh, and uh, this is something, again, we've, we, we, we started developing that in 2015. Uh, as some of the previous speakers pointed out, the, the, the critical point here is to capture the critical amount of high quality data, properly annotated data, uh, and, and use this data to develop these algorithms that, that produce outputs that matters to us uh, in the operating room. And intraoperative adverse events matter. So these are the two examples of uh, intraoperative adverse events, intraoperative bleeding, and tissue injury. So. Uh, uh, bleeding is, uh, is obviously important. Uh, we, can we can identify it and we can also uh, quantify uh, the volume and velocity of bleeding we observe. So often it's a, it's a, uh, uh, a slow, uh, uh, a minimal bleeding that 
obviously will not have impact on the clinical outcome, but it is an important indicator. So if I, uh, during a dissection of the gallbladder, cause 300 episodes of uh, bleeding, uh, minor bleeding, and my colleague uh, identified, uh, 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 causes only three, four of these episodes, obviously my technique is inferior, uh, and uh, we need to, we, we can use that as, uh, an, as another uh, parameter in the quantification of, of surgical uh, performance. And this is our short-term vision. This is something that we're working on to be able to quantify performance uh, in real time. So this is something that we can see uh, during each phase of the procedure, what is the, the performance index. Uh, and now we have more and more data that uh, will help us use that to predict uh, clinical outcomes. So we know we can use that to guide our decisions in the operating room. So we know that we're entering a phase that is high risk. If my performance or my resident performance is inferior in that phase, uh, I can take over and again uh, use a little more uh, guidance in the way we share a case and the way we use various uh, uh, opportunities uh, to, uh, uh, to teach uh, in the operating room. Finally, I want to show uh, a practical example, a randomized t -t trial that our group conducted a couple of years ago, looking at the impact of this data, the, our ability, especially when we deliver it uh, in a structured way uh, to our learners and see how it impacts their performance. So uh, this is an example of, uh, of uh, how we uh, can incorporate uh, uh, video analysis and use this video analysis uh, to uh, uh, provide structured coaching uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in our practice. And again, we, uh, uh, this is not uh, uh, research for research sake, this is not uh, data generation uh, for, for data sake. These are some practical examples of how, can, how we can use this to make us better teachers and provide better educational opportunities for our uh, learners in, in the operating room. So this, as I said, this was a randomized trial. We looked at individuals who got access to traditional coaching and individuals who got, and a group that got access to this structured coaching using objective data uh, and, uh, and access to video data. And we showed that coaching worked. Uh, it, it wasn't surprising, but we showed that we were able to significantly improve performance in the operating room and reduce, and reduce the number of errors and adverse events uh, with 50%. So finally, I think uh, there is a lot of promise here uh, with this new field of uh, surgical AI, surgical data science. I think uh, we can do what other high-risk industries and uh, uh, high-performance high industries like professional sports, aviation, nuclear, and all industries have done. They've used data, they've deployed modern data science in their practice, and that helped them make this transition from safe to ultra-safe. So I feel that if we do that, if we're able to make this uh, challenging but very rewarding uh, move from research to, uh, uh, to clinical practice, we will be able to achieve this vision for the future of surgery that will be data-driven uh, and it will be precise, predictive, uh, transparent, and most importantly, ultra-safe. So thank you for inviting me.